Prepare yourself to embark on a great journey. Experience the world of science, the mystery, the intrigue, and... Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Join biologist Dr. Sean Vran. What are you talking about? Astronomer Dr. Otterbon Bhattacharjee. So, what do you guys want to know? And paleontologist Dr. Thomas Schiller. So that's really my area of expertise. Because when we discuss science, we're going to have to explain it to each other. The Science Knights will be crusading your airwaves. The thoughts in it make you feel better. Hello, West Texas. We are the Science Knights. My name is Dr. Sean Graham. I'm here with Dr. Anurban Bhattacharjee and Dr. Thomas Schiller. And today, tonight, we're going to talk to you about science. We are each from completely different fields in science. And uh, so we don't understand everything there is to know about science. And I know that probably our listeners don't either. And that's actually a good thing. Because when we discuss science with you guys, we're going to have to explain it to each other. We're going to have to stop each other every now and then and say, hey, what are you talking about? And we all have to kind of break it down. We've got a lot of experience talking to younger people about science. Uh, we teach uh, college and we, we do a lot of outreach for small children. So I think we're pretty good at explaining science to ordinary people. Or at least that's going to be our goal here. And so what we're going to do right now, we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves because this is our very first show. As I said, I'm Dr. Sean Graham. I'm a vertebrate biologist for the most part. I go out in the field looking for things like snakes and salamanders. Those are my favorite organisms. And I basically just run around and try to catch them. That's pretty much what my job is when I'm not grading papers and trying to chase students around. So what about you, Anurban? Uh So I am an astronomer, but I also teach physics. So And... Um, I try to work on these things called uh, quasars, which are like uh, extremely far away, and these are galaxies. Basically, they reside. Um, um, the, we're talking something um, galaxies which are extremely far away, and I study them. And since this, these galaxies are very far away, um, what when we look at them, we are and and the, we look at the area surrounding them. We are kind of looking at the universe when it was much younger because the light takes some time to come to us. So we are looking at things that things that used to happen when the universe was younger. So I kind of study those objects. So, and Thomas? Hello, West Texas. I am Dr. Tom Schiller, and I am a vertebrate paleontologist and a geologist. Um, and I like to wander the desert and search for dinosaur bones, mainly the desert in uh, Big Bend National Park in northern Mexico. So that's really my area of expertise. Well, Sean and Thomas, you guys both do vertebrate, right? Basically, things that have a spinal cord. If that, would that be something like a vertebrate, like right? Yeah, See? we've even got more in common because you know, I kind of grew up loving dinosaurs. It's kind of what I got into some of the things I study mm. uh, for the first time. It was uh, because I really loved dinosaurs when I was a kid. I go around the backyard looking for dinosaurs, couldn't find any. So I ended up settling for toads and, and snakes and things, which are, you know, the closest thing I could find to a living dinosaur. So you, you're telling me if, t if you're in a desert, just like going around like Thomas, you would have, you would have studied instead dinosaurs. I think if I'd grown up in a different area, I might have ended up being a paleontologist, too. It's entirely possible. The place where I grew up, there were no, no dinosaur bones within oh, okay. 100 miles. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And what I like about the three of us is that we kind of cover... Really, let's be honest, there are three coolest fields in science, right? Agreed. You know, biology is great. I mean, there's a lot of health implications or, you know, uh, the ecosystem down to the cell, to the molecular level. You know, I have to teach all of that stuff in my classes, everything from DNA up to, you know, ecosystem level stuff. So it's a lot and it covers a lot. And then, but we've got stars and planets and cool things like mm -hmm. that with Anurban. And of course, what's cooler than dinosaurs. So we, we kind of cover the really good stuff. Um, and we haven't I mean, left anything. I mean, if we left anything out, is there anything? I don't anything? know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Like the way you're saying this is kind of like uh, things that used to be, things that are, and things that shall come to pass. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty deep. I promise that's, we're not going to get that deep ever again on this well, show. That man. sounds a little rehearsed, Honor. I mean, I was going to say, this is, I mean, I was just quoting Gandalf in a way. So, is that yeah. Gandalf? A little bit. Okay, yeah. that, that'll work. Yeah. Is he a physicist too? Oh, he's, he's the best, best. 
I mean, he's the he's best. The best he's I'm the best not familiar ever. with him. Yeah, he's from this amazing place called Middle Earth. You might want to check it out. Ah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it's very it's very unique. So yeah. As you can see, uh, occasionally we will be uh, talking about pop culture stuff, movies. Yeah, we yeah, will yeah. get into movies and we'll talk about... We're not going to be nitpicky like some uh, scientists who get on Twitter and, you know, hammer the movie Interstellar for tiny little details, you know. But we will probably... We will still talk hammer about, Interstellar. Yeah, we, we, we will might, still, We yeah, might hammer yeah, Interstellar, yeah. but yeah. not. I don't know. I'll, I'll back you off of the nitpicky stuff. Yeah. But, you know, we grew up watching these movies, these science fiction movies, these adventure movies that kind of got us into it. Right, I think uh, Thomas, you've got a really good one in your background. What, what was it? And you're, everyone's probably thinking Jurassic Park. It was but not Jurassic wrong. Park. No, it was it was the Indiana Jones films. Um, Indiana Jones actually portrayed as an archaeologist in the film, but was based on the life of a paleontologist called Roy Chapman Andrews. So um, I grew up watching Indiana Jones, and of course, when Jurassic Park came out. It was incredible, and I had to convince all the kids at school that I wanted to be a paleontologist before they did. Um, <laughs> so there were many arguments on the, uh, the kindergarten playground about that. What about you, Anurban? Was there anything, uh, any specific movie that really opened up your Like a sci-fi? Eyes? Um, it wouldn't movie, have to be a uh, sci-fi movie, but... Um, I mean, I read sci-fi books and stuff, but it's mostly Cosmos, which was written by Carl Sagan. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Right. so read reading like, the book Cosmos? Yeah, yeah, 12 or 13, uh, 12, uh, when I was 12 or 13 years old, I read the book. So uh, that's pretty much it. And I think, uh, and uh, I mean, speaking as a wider, Cosmos has played a very vital role for people who has born in 70s, 70s like a vital role for uh, people who are born in between 70s and 80s. So uh, don't you think like... Uh, would it, uh, would yeah, that same be? here. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I was just thinking of this the other day that my sister bought me that book when I was a teenager. And uh, at the time I was kind of, I guess, lost, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And it, and it kind of, st- I don't know if I'd be sitting in this chair right now if I hadn't read Cosmos also. It's There's like, a lot of biology uh, in it. Yeah, a lot of biology, a lot of chemistry, a lot of Everything. I mean, it has like uh, something for everybody. So yeah. yes. But for me, it was the movie Anaconda. I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. It was. It was actually indie, man. I saw. I saw the indie movies. I'm pretty sure all three of them in the theater. I'm Anaconda? a little older than you. The the Indiana Jones movies. Oh, okay. I was, still, I was <laughs> all like, three of the Anaconda. Movies. I was like still thinking. So, uh, uh, I know like and everything about this. Uh, so I was just wondering since uh, we have gathered today, you guys wanted to talk about black holes today, right? I think that's going to be our topic of choice. Each week, okay. we'll cover a different topic in our own fields, and then we all have to kind of explain it to each other. And this week we're starting off because there's huge news, and, right, uh, with the I first mean, yes. photograph of a black hole, and you're going to explain to us why that's so exciting. So, and not just like, uh, we, since it's the first show, and we're, like, for example, one of the shows we are going to talk about, uh, like, um, uh, vaccines and immunity, right? I don't know much about it. I, I trust in them because doctors and Biochemists, they, I mean, they they say that, and, right. and I mean, that's what you do. You trust in the experts, right? So we're going to try to bring that back, back a little because bit because we are, of course, the Science Knights. Nice. Yes. Welcome back, everybody. It's the Science Knights again, and this episode we're going to be talking to Anurban Bhattacharjee about black holes. So, what do you guys want to know? Well, the big news. <laughs> the big news is um, all over the place. Well, we're recording this here in May 2019, and we've just now got a photograph, I guess, of the the very first photograph of Black Hole. It was big news. And so uh, what's so exciting about that? Okay, so what is most exciting about it is we are... So first of all, nothing accepts, uh, nothing can escape from Black Hole. So... One thing we have to clear, black holes do not emit anything because uh, uh, black holes do not emit anything um, or um, you cannot escape from the surface of a black hole. If you are standing, let's say, on the surface of a black hole, um, chances are we are all going to die if we, if we are there. But if we end up, um, so if you try to escape, so we can't because the gravitational attraction of the black hole uh, doesn't allow even the, even light to escape from black hole so 
Now, if you do not even allow the light to escape the black hole, uh, how can, what, why are they talking about they have taken a photograph of this black hole, right? That would be the question. That doesn't make any sense. You're right? Like, yeah. how would you do that? Because nothing's coming out of it. Right. So what are they uh, taking the uh, image? So if you have looked at the image, you have seen like some kind of a bright um, color, like a reddish color, like a circular ring surrounding a very dark area. Yeah, it looks like a big... Uh I don't know. Black hole. Big black, black hole. Black hole. <laughs> like black hole. But it's surrounded so, by some sort exactly. of a, like almost like a fire. It looks like it's like looks, looks yeah. like a circular fire but, with a big black so hole. So exactly. So that is what you're seeing. You are seeing matter uh, which is at extremely high temperature falling into that black hole. They're moving around. So what you're seeing is basically the edge of the black hole. Yeah. And this is the first time we have managed to uh, image this. Now, you have to also be careful. Like, if, there's, if there was too much material, then it would completely surround the black hole. And you would not be able to see it. Oh, yeah, it. yeah. I never thought of that. Yes. I didn't think of that. So, if there's all. a lot of material. Because it wouldn't have to be a ring. It could be like a big bubble, bubble. around it. So, and then if it had that, you would not be able then to no see it. Then no one would be convinced. Yeah, no. You just they must have been really wondering, like, so, oh, man, this is not going to look like anything, right? So, yeah. So, the way this, uh, the material around the black hole is um, uh, structured, or rather, like, falling into it, uh, falls in a disc like shape. So called an accretion disk, and it had um, it had enough material, but not a lot of material that will like completely uh, surround the black hole. So we were able to look at the material that was moving around the black hole, and falling into it. it will fall into it at some point, but so which basically defined uh, the black uh, the black hole's radius. So we were able to see that. Now an another point is this black hole is over millions of light years away. So when we, even though this black hole is bigger than the size of our solar system, uh, it's actually very small when we're looking at it through a telescope, like really, really tiny. So this was a achievement on that level to actually image that black yeah, hole. So. Yeah, why don't you break it down for our listeners, how they pulled this off? Because I've heard it's, it's a pretty crazy endeavor. Okay, now this is a, this is a very sophisticated technique. And this technique has um, been applied, um, been around like for 30, 40 years. Um, and, but, uh, and it's called, uh, they use a technique, um, a property of light, which is called interference, where you get the light to basically interfere with each other and create a pattern. So I'm not really going to go into a lot of depth, and it's it is not something very simplistic that I can explain it to you. Yeah, yeah. Like a <clears throat> like a very um, if somebody can do that, and that's great. But, well, I uh, kind of, I was kind of thinking just more from the technical aspect, right? They use multiple telescopes. They use multiple at tele multiple yeah. angles. That, get, get into that a little bit. Uh, how uh, they actually did the imaging, because surely there's crazy equations of how they capture the light, how they're able and to digitize it. We, we all, don't need to know all that, okay, but just so the kind basically of basic the project thing. was around yeah. like around 13 telescopes and they had like 200 over 200 people working 13 telescopes. 13 telescopes and two approximately don't count uh, uh, on that number. Sure, so yeah. uh, so 13 telescopes, approximately 200 people uh, working all over the world. Uh, and then um, one of the telescopes, uh, interestingly, was in South Pole. So, uh, no kidding. Yes, one of the telescopes were in South Pole. Uh, so uh, not exactly at South Pole, but in Antarctica. So it's one of them there. So uh, what you get is a really big uh, baseline. So uh, you have that. And uh, that is actually when you have a... Um, so what is... A, at what each of those telescopes are now start doing, they can getting the image, like as a uh, think of like a triangulation, if you want to think. So, so they act as that, and <clears throat> they get the image. The thirteen different telescopes are getting the image from that single source, getting them together, and then they combine it to give you that uh, black hole's image. So, and uh, uh, the and uh, so there's a lot of data coming in. So they uh, they were observing. And uh, second of all, you had to um, make sure your timing is exactly right. 
because uh, you are at different points of the earth so the light that you're coming there uh, so the li light rays need to be exactly matched up at exactly what time the light rays are arriving at your telescope wow because you're going to combine the light rays from 13 different telescopes uh, and when how, i say light how, how can they do that if if it's like daytime for somebody and nighttime for somebody else good i was good i asked me that question so i'm coming i was coming to that so they observed in radio waves so radio oh. wave uh, is a form of light, just like X-ray is, and ultraviolet, infrared, these are all forms of light. Now, so, that's a little misleading, because I, I wouldn't consider those parts of light. I, you know, are you avoiding using the word electromagnetic spectrum? I was, okay. so I just, like, well, it sounds it's more for, technical. Yeah, 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 because yeah, so, there's just like, just a, there's a small piece of the electromagnetic spectrum that is visible light. So exactly. And then there's a ton of other stuff out so there that along is, the same band, right? That's exactly. And so it's just another kind of radiation or... That's right. exactly the reason I wasn't mentioning visible light. I just right. kept on saying light. I know even then people would think it's a visible yeah, light. Yeah, okay. But it's electromagnetic radiation mm -hmm. and it's radio waves. And so, so I was talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. So the EHT... Uh, this 13 telescope, what would be in layman's term, would act like 13 cameras taking images in uh, radio wavelength. So radio wavelength is basically your frequency, uh, like FM and AM stations. You have this, and like for KVLF, is this like at 12.40 AM, so you go there and go to that particular frequency. So all these... Uh, 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 your telescopes were the radio wavelengths at certain frequencies and they were capturing whatever light wave was coming at the frequency and they got together put all of those 13 uh, uh, pieces together from th uh, 13 different telescopes and got the image out from there put them all together so but as you can see uh, if you have ever tried com uh, anybody who has tried combining images and ha get just getting normal visual images if you take one to from two different cameras, how hard is those things? So hard are those things to do? So yeah. Thomas. So so who was the first person to hypothesize about black holes? Okay, so now that's a very interesting question. So uh, what people don't realize is the idea of a black hole is over two hundred and forty years old now. So approximately, because in seventeen eighty three there is this amazing guy called John Mitchell. So, which is very interesting. John Mitchell was also at that at his time was very well known for as a geologist. He's not like uh, his contributions to astronomy were hidden. So, and uh, contributions to astronomy were pretty kind of like um, like uh, at his when he was alive. He was not like John Mitchell, than amazing astronomers. So uh, he was more well known as a geologist. I think you have heard of him, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So he did a lot of like, uh, I guess the plate, uh, like the early idea of a plate movement and stuff like that. I think he worked on that, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. So while, um, so at 1783, he actually submitted a paper to the Royal uh, Academy of Sciences. Before that, he actually sent a letter to Henry Cavendish. Um, who is actually who measured the gravitational constant? That's another uh, thing we can talk about later. But um, but yeah, so he proposed this idea that, uh, for example, if you throw something from Earth, it does not leave the Earth, right? It falls back to Earth. To escape Earth's gravitational field, you have to throw something at uh, at a speed of eleven point two kilometers per second. So then it will escape Earth and it can just uh, move out of Earth's attraction. So he said, well, if there is a star that is really, really massive, uh, then even light, if light was a particle, because uh, at that time we believed light is a form of, our form of particles, uh, would not escape those stars because they're really massive. So the gravitational attraction would be very high and light would not escape. So you cannot observe those stars. So 1783 published in 1784 and then uh, in 1796 uh, there was a, a French mathematician called um, uh, Simon Laplace he came up with the actual derivation of how big those stars would be uh, only the critical um, issue is what uh, with them was that like um, they thought the density of those stars would be equal to the density of our own earth 
so that's a problem there because black holes have a really, really, like they're called infinitely dense. So they have a different densities altogether kind of thing, not in very high densities. So, uh, yeah, so he did that calculation in 1796. And John Mitchell also suggested uh, that uh, he is, uh, he could, you could calculate black holes influence of uh, uh, by observing, it's uh, like, for example, black hole attracts other things. Things will at big things will attract others, uh, other things. If you are there, like for example, sun attracts Earth. So if black holes are there, they're going to attract something else. So if there was something visible star, it would attract the black holes. So um, and uh, so that's the one way. Even way back in 1790s and 1800s, people had that idea. Okay, so here's kind of an off the wall question for you. What if a black hole were to appear right now adjacent to planet Earth? We would die. <laughs> That's a pretty straightforward answer. Yes. How quickly would that happen? How, how quickly would it suck us all down into the black hole? That is an interesting uh, question. It would actually depend on how close to the black hole we are. There are certain... Um, so Okay. Uh, then so we're talking about what if it happened, it was just over the baseball field at Coconut. <laughs> okay. Right there. Uh, how big is the black hole's... Black hole is the size of Hancock Hill. Quick calculation. Um, so Back of the envelope. <laughs> We'd uh, all die, everybody. And I guess that's going to have to be our show. Well, that's really amazing stuff. Thanks for kind of explaining all that to us, Honorbon. But, you know, of course, the big question that everybody's going to be wanting to ask, and I want to ask, is, you know, I guess who cares? What what you know? They're they're far away in space. They're not going to really affect our lives. So why should anyone care about all the effort that went into discovering, theorizing, and photographing a black hole? I mean, um, and I initially and also I like forgot to mention is like that black holes are one way we can. T uh, it was we were able to taste I Einstein's theory of uh, general, general theory of relativity too. So they worked. Uh, uh, he kind of uh, actually finally put the mathematical framework for that in 1900s, so early 1900s. So why should we care? Um, now the very interesting thing about black holes is they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. It's not just one single shape. So you have black holes um, which are theori theorized to exist, very tiny black holes called primordial black holes, mm -hmm. which existed when Black Big Bang happened. And there are like stellar mass black holes which happen when like big stars, when they die out, they collapse and form like black holes which have uh, way the have the same type of mass as our own sun does, uh, kind of and some little bit bigger. No, and at the same time, Right now, we have discovered there are supermassive black holes, we call them. And these weigh more than a million times of our own sun. And our sun weighs two times, two times 10 to the power 30 kilograms. That's a big number. Uh, think about that. Uh, su our sun, in terms of Earth, uh, weighs a uh, million times more. So that would be a good way to visualize. Like you take a million Earths and you put them together and you get a sun. And... The stars that from black holes are even bigger than that. Just give you a perspective. Now, these supermassive black holes uh, range from million times the mass of our sun going to billion times. So over that. So, now, these supermassive black holes, where are they found? They're found in the heart of uh, all major, really big galaxies. If you observe them, they are sitting right in the middle. Now, the question is, why do we care? What we have found out that those black holes, this million mass that I'm quoting, million to billion, whatever mass we are looking at, this, so the surveys that we did found out the mass of those black holes is actually correlated to the bulge of that galaxy. So, so the galaxy, like this the galaxies come in spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies, and the bulge of those galaxies uh, mass actually correlates to the mass of the black hole. Now the bulge of that galaxy weighs actually thousand times more than the black hole. But the thousand times factor has been consistent over multiple galaxies. I'm not just talking about one or two. Pretty much most galaxies in our local universe, which is, includes Andromeda galaxy and things like that, if they have a black hole in their center, they will their black hole's mass kind of correlates to the galaxy's property. So what does that mean? That means the galaxy's property, uh, somehow the black hole influenced the growth of our galaxies mm -hmm. and vice versa. So that proves, and this is very recent. This observational evidence came like 20 to 30 years ago. We are finding that. So 
we study supermassive black holes because we want to find out how our Milky Way ca came about and from why. And if we know our Milky Way, we'll know how our solar system comes about. And from there, we will know how Earth comes to, came to be kind of an all chain reaction. Wow. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, to understand the architecture and how our galaxies are put mm. together. You've got to understand your black holes. Well, that's going to do it for tonight's show. Thanks for tuning in to the Science Nights, and then we'll see you next time here on Science Nights.